This is Alex Edmonds on the launch date for my book, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. And I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you who signed up to attend the various launch events and the companies and conferences who invited me to talk about the book. And I'm really sorry that I'm unable to do this in person because of the crisis, so instead I wanted to give this quick message. Now, some of you kindly wrote to me and asked, well, am I disappointed that the events aren't taking place? Yeah, it's tempting to feel disappointed after working for the, on the book for a number of years, but hopefully those events will still happen a few months down the line. I can wait. But unfortunately, there's contractors and freelancers and the self-employed who might not be able to wait. And so this crisis further highlights the importance of capitalism serving wider society. So what I want to do in this message is two things. Now, I want to talk about what is the theme of the book and what are the main takeaways, as I would have done in the launch, but much more briefly. And second, to apply those insights for the serious crisis that the world currently finds itself in. So let's start with the first. Why did I choose to write the book a couple of years ago? It's because of the serious crisis that capitalism found itself in, and in fact still finds itself in today. Because in the eyes of many people, it's a rigged game. We've seen rising profits and soaring CEO pay, but on the other hand, ordinary incomes are flat and carbon emissions are rising. So this has led to a number of calls to radically reform business. And some of those calls are quite extreme to change capitalism as we know it with heavy regulation. Now, while I do agree that business does need to be reformed, we can't go too far the other way. We need a more nuanced set of solutions. Why? Well, that's for two reasons. First, is while I do believe there is a role for regulation, there's a limit to what regulation can achieve. It can only achieve compliance, but not true commitment. If companies' hearts don't change, then what they can do is just comply with the regulation to as minimum as possible and then still try to extract as much profits as possible. So what we need is a solution which is in actually companies' interest to adopt because then they'll go above and beyond what's the minimum required by regulation. And the second is, while it might seem popular to straitjacket businesses and take away profits, actually, profits play an important role within society. It's profits that companies earn, which they reinvest to launch the new products of the future. And importantly, profits go to investors. Now, we often like to think of investors as them and society as us. But investors are not them. They are us. They're not just nameless, faceless capitalists, but they include parents saving for their children's education, or they may include pension funds which are investing for reti retirees. So what we need is a solution that works for both society and investors. Now this them and us mentality is what I call in the book the pie splitting mentality. That is the idea that the value that a company creates is given by a fixed pie. So what it means is that if you're a CEO wanting to maximise profits, if the pie is fixed, the only way that you can give a higher slice to your investors is by taking slices away from the rest of society. So you could price gouge customers, you could pay workers as little as possible, and you can pay scant attention to the environment. And then on the flip side, if you're standing up for society and wanting to help business serve stakeholders better, the only way to do that is to reduce profit, perhaps through heavy regulation. So what the book is about is a different approach to business, which is not the them and us fighting that we've seen for actually centuries, but in fact it works for both investors and society. And that's why the book is called Grow the Pie. It's about the pie growing mentality, which is that we can create more value so that all parties will benefit. So what this means is that if you're a business, run first and foremost with the desire to create social value, to make products that transform customers' lives for the better, to provide employees with a healthy and enriching workplace, and to preserve the environment for future generations, you're not donating part of the pie from investors to society. You're actually growing the pie 
and then investors will ultimately benefit. Now, it's important to stress that you didn't do all of those things for instrumental reasons, but you're serving society intrinsically because it's the right thing to do. But as a byproduct, unexpectedly, things that help benefit society ultimately will feed back into profits. For example, you could treat your work as well out of genuine concern for them as humans, not human resources, but then they become more motivated and productive, and then you become more successful. Or it may well be that you develop a new drug to solve a public health crisis without thinking about, can I make money from this? But ultimately, you end up successfully commercialising it. Now, you might think, well, this idea that the pie can be grown, that sounds almost too good to be true. It's like wishful thinking. So a big chunk of the book, is to provide rigorous, large-scale evidence that this is something which is realistic. And it's important to stress that the evidence is large-scale. It's across hundreds of companies from different industries. It's not based on a single anecdote because you could always find one story to support whatever you want to support. But it's also equally important to acknowledge that the evidence is not all one way. And throughout the book, I try to be careful and present evidence against the book's key propositions so that the evidence I present is not just one-sided. So there is evidence that the average socially responsible investment fund does not pay up, does not beat the market. And there are sin industries like tobacco and alcohol which have done well. And so what this means is that for implementation, that needs to be nuanced. And indeed, again, a big chunk of the book is how to put this into practice so this is not just food for thought, but a plan of action. And in terms of putting it into practice, I divide this into three sections. One is for companies, one is for investors, and one is for citizens. So let's start with companies. So the fact that the evidence is nuanced means that companies can't just invest in every stakeholder paying carefree attention to profits because we need to be disciplined about where we invest. So one of the main criticisms about responsible business and the main defences of shareholder value maximisation is that if shareholder value rather than society was your goal, there was a clear way of making decisions. You calculate the net present value and you take a project if it's positive. People argue that if your goal is to serve society, there is no clear way to make decisions. So what I try to present is a clear framework that leaders can use to decide what investments to take and what investments to turn down. So it actually is not the case that responsible business is fluffy. It's not that anything goes. We can still have a framework to guide us on how to make these important decisions. The second thing to note in terms of companies is it highlights how responsible business is something which is urgent and fundamental. So we often think about serving society as being an optional extra that we can delegate to a corporate social responsibility department and only care about if we have the money and the time. But the evidence that serving society ultimately leads to long-term profit suggests that purpose is something which is fundamental. It is a CEO level issue. It is not just worthy, it is urgent. And the third um, thing in terms of implementation is the importance of a business being purposeful. Now we hear the word purpose being banded around and we often don't know what it means. So how I define purpose is purpose is the answer to the question, how is the world a better place by your company being here? How is the world a better place by your company being here? Now importantly, a purpose cannot be to earn profits but a company will be profitable as a byproduct of serving its purpose. And the important thing about purpose is that I stress how it needs to be targeted and focused. A purpose can't be all things to all people. Now, it might sound great to have a purpose statement saying we're going to serve customers and employees and the environment and suppliers and communities and investors. But when the rubber hits the road, that's not practical because leaders face decisions where there's trade-offs. For example, if you shut down a polluting plant, that helps the environment, but it hurts workers. So a broad purpose statement is not going to guide you in these tricky decisions, but a focused purpose, which highlights who is the first among equals, 
will help you navigate those tricky trade -offs. So let's move to investors. And what the book talks about is the importance of investor stewardship. So what this means is that investors shouldn't just buy stocks and hope to ride on the coattails of the innovations from companies, but can actively engage with these companies in order to help them on their journey and also hold them accountable if they are pursuing profit over long-term purpose. And the book talks about how to implement stewardship, which is targeted and which is evidence-based, and also what questions to ask in order to figure out is a company truly purpose-led or does it just have a nice statement? And finally, let's turn to citizens. Because we often think that as citizens, we are powerless. In the light of huge businesses, capitalism is something which is simply done to us and we're just bystanders. But that's actually not the case. So what I stress is the role of citizens' agency. So as individual investors, as customers, and as employees, we have large power to shape businesses. And in fact, that power is perhaps larger today than it has ever been, for example, with social media. So single citizens who started the Delete Uber or boycott Volkswagen campaigns, they were able to hold even the largest companies in the world to account. So let's now turn to what this means to the common very serious crisis. So one thing that the book highlights is that we're all in this together. Companies, investors and citizens, we're not squabbling over a fixed pie. We can work together to grow the pie and then everybody can benefit. And I think this is relevant for the current crisis because what's unique about this crisis is this has hurt everybody. So let's think back to the financial crisis. So that financial crisis was, in some sense, a them and us situation. So it was caused by the actions of, of some bankers and then millions of ordinary citizens were affected. And indeed, it may well have been that those bankers got off scot-free because some of them were able to cash out before the financial crisis hit. But what's unique about this crisis is that everybody has been hurt. So even famous actors, influential politicians, some of them have unfortunately contracted the virus. And so the really small silver lining of this really serious crisis is that we are all in it together and therefore it requires all of us to work together to form a solution. And so again, I'm going to talk about what does responsible business mean for companies, for investors and for citizens. And the one unifying theme that I think everybody should ask themselves, regardless of which of those three roles you play, is what is in your hand. So what do I mean by this? So let's say you're an executive in a company. What is in your hand that asks you, what are the resources that your company has and how can it serve wider society? Now, for some companies, that answer might be obvious. So for Sainsbury, what they have is retail stores. And what they chose to do was to use that not to make profit, but to serve wider society by reserving early morning slots for health workers and for the elderly and vulnerable, even though they're not the most profitable customers to, to sell to. But interestingly, even if you're a company who might, you might not think that you have something directly related to the crisis, you do still have something in your hand that could be valuable. For example, Chelsea Football Club, what does football have for the crisis? Well, what was in their hand was their hotel and they've chosen to allow health workers to stay in their hotel to save the long commutes back home every day, which is particularly difficult given public transport has been scaled back. Or there's a chain of gyms called One Rebel. Again, how can a gym help in this crisis? Well, what is in the hand is a lot of gym space, which is currently being unused. And what they've offered is for the health service to use that space for beds and other health facilities if it becomes necessary. And so what Responsible Business is about is not just about child donations and philanthropy. The book stresses the importance of innovation, trying to grow the pie by thinking innovatively about what is in your hand and how can we use it to serve society. And again, if there is a small silver lining to this crisis, hopefully it will spark innovation, people to think about how we can use our resources to serve wider society, and that will hopefully then res reduce resource usage going forward once the world recovers from this crisis. Let's now move to investors. Well, what is in your hand? 
Well, you control the nation's wealth. You've been entrusted the wealth of ordinary citizens and you're entrusting them to companies. And as a result of that, what is in your hand is that you call the shops in terms of companies. Because you're investors, you get to vote on director elections, you get to choose to take your money away from companies. And so you can use what is in your hand, this influence over companies, to support them in their efforts. It could be you choose to write private letters to CEOs or boards saying, we know this is a time of crisis, but we're not worried about whether you hit your quarterly earnings target. We're not worried about whether you cut the dividend and we'll actually support you if you need to raise more capital because we recognise that now more than ever, this is a time in which it's important to pursue long-term social value rather than these short-term numbers. And what about in terms of citizens? Well, what is in your hand? Well, the most important thing which is in your hand is your own actions. And again, now more than ever before, your actions could have life-changing consequences. So self-isolation could save lives and choosing not to panic buy that allows other people to have access to their scarce resources. But panic buying and self-isolation, that's been covered extensively in the news. So instead, I want to focus on something else, which is another principle of the book, is that when the price shrinks, everybody has to bear a smaller share. And some people, what is in your hand is your ability to bear more of a reduction in your slice than others. So if you're in the lucky position to do that, take some of that load. So I have a friend who's a lawyer who's chosen to buy forward 100 coffees from his local coffee shop. So that provided them with 300 pounds of immediate liquidity, and then he'll just get those 100 coffees over the next year or so. Another friend, actually, he was one of the peer reviewers of this book, Ben Yo. He's chosen to make small loans of £500 available to small businesses or the self-employed to be paid back over the next five years. And on my part, I was hoping to get married in six weeks' time. That is unlikely to happen. But uh, the wedding band and the photographer, they're self-employed, so we've offered to pay them now, even though we might not be using their services um, many months from now. Now, not everybody might have in their hand uh, the, the funds in order to, to contribute, but everybody has, has words. And, and, and what is surprising is the idea that even small things can make a big difference. So unfortunately, there might be some people watching this video who, who might end up sick and in the hospital, either themselves or, or to support a, a family member. And when you're surrounded by really busy doctors and, and nurses and receptionists, something small, like a small but genuine thank you, that can go a huge way in a time of crisis. I guess that's all that I, I had to say. And uh, the book is available uh, right now in the standard sources, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. And uh, if you read it and it resonates, I'd be really grateful if, if you could spread the word. But I also recognise that not everybody will be able to afford to buy a book, uh, particularly in, in this crisis time. So what I've put on the book's website, which is www.growthepie.net, is a lot of free material. So those of you who are interested in responsible business but not able to, to buy the book, there is, uh, for example, my Gresham College lecture series on how business can better serve society, and also some other articles that I've written about responsible business. And also, regardless of whether you've bought the book or you haven't, I've written many articles about things that have happened after I finished the book several months ago, which are pertinent to this issue of responsible business. Well, thank you very much for, for your attention and I hope everybody stays safe and stays well in these difficult times because we are all in this together. Thank you very much.